So when ho hockey historians like me look back at the 1980s and 90s, for the NHL, certain good things stand out. Uh, the amount of talented players, <clears throat> the rise of uh, Gretzky and Mario and all the elite players, but also this was an era of the enforcers. And one of the most feared and one of the most uh, head scratching ones was this guy. Dave Brown, you couldn't teach this, six foot five, 210 pounds. Uh, his goon incidents, uh, especially with Thomas Antrim, drew ire from the media, from opponents. He did a lot of good work with the Flyers, Edmonton, and uh, San Jose, but what he, what he did on the ice in relation to his role as an enforcer almost changed the game uh, forever because when he, uh, he attacked Thomas Antrim, uh, Sports Illustrated, all the major media in the States saying, you know, this type of uh, goon hockey has to go. Well, we're going to we're gonna break it down for you. We're not going to point fingers at Dave Brown. It just, uh, type of player he was in the area he played in. Now, uh, the pride of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, born October 12, 1962, first came to major prominence with the Spokane Flyers of the WHL and Yorkton Terriers of the SJHL in 81. Now, with the Blades in 82, his hometown squad, uh, this is where the Flyers were looking for his grit. He had 44 points in 62 games with 344 minutes in penalties. Now, one goal in the whole season, and the Flyers decided to take a, a late-round draft pick on him. Seven round, 140 overall. Now, he was available to be drafted in 81, but was not taken despite, again, being eligible. He eventually debuted uh, for Philadelphia against Boston on March 12, 1983, and this came about after <laughs> he wreaked destruction in uh, the AHL for Maine. His first season in the AHL, he had 14 points in 71 games. Combined with the regular season and the postseason, 525 minutes of penalties in 89 games. Now, he was called up for the Flyers, where he had his first fight. He had two games. Now, 84, more season in Springfield, a little bit quieter. <coughs> he showed his offensive uh, tally, 31 points in 59 games, including 17 goals. Now, he finally broke in with the Flyers full-time at 84 with six points in the regular season and with two playoff games. Uh, 85, he became their part-time enforcer with nine points in 57 games, 165 minutes and penalties. But by 86... Again, he was scoring more goals, but he was getting major penalties. 86 and 87 season combined, he had over 500 minutes, uh, 500 minutes in penalties in a regular season, and nearly 100 in uh, in the playoffs. 87, he was part of that team that made it to the uh, Stanley Cup final and played a big role with 59 minutes in penalties. By by, but by 88 and 89, due to injuries and suspensions and uh, other factors, he's is. Mound of play was going down, even though you look at the 88 season, he had 12 goals. But he uh, he lost his scoring uh, prowess uh, when he moved over to Edmonton. Uh, he only scored three goals over three seasons with them. So we're going to break it down a little bit about what uh, what happened. He he was part of some interesting occurrences in NHL history. He had the. Uh, he holds a record for the Flyers for the fastest two goals by two players in one game, where his uh, teammate Brian Prop on December 2nd, 86, he scored within seven seconds. Now he led Philadelphia in penalty minutes, 137 and 94. He eventually played on Edmonton Stanley Cup winner in 1990, but did not skate in any older uh, Stanley Cup Finals games versus Boston. Now he eventually went into pro scouting and other uh, factors upon uh, retirement, uh, especially for uh, uh, the Rangers. He was uh, also an assistant coach for the Flyers that made the Stanley Cup final in the late uh, 90s, there for two years, 97-98. A scout with the Rangers between 99 and 03, then director of professional scouting for the Rangers for three years, then back to the Flyers where he was director of player personnel from 07 to 13, then director of professional scouting for most of the last number of years, a position he still, uh, he still holds. Now, uh, again, the AC with uh, Philadelphia gave him a little bit of experience behind the bench. He's applied that to pro scouting. Now, 
He fought Boston's Gord Kluzak in his first NHL game. The fight took place at 15-19 of the first period, and Brown smashed Kluzak with multiple lefts to the eye before Kluzak was set to begin fighting. He was taken to local hospital where it was determined that he had no rectal damage, but the Boston press were on him over this. Now, mostly left wing for Philadelphia in 84, but the injury started to, to catch up to him. He played uh, m- uh, most of the 85 season injured as he had a bruised shoulder uh, in the campaign. He missed part of 87 with a cracked rib, an injury suffered when he got, got caught in his own stick after scoring a goal and then tri- being tripped by Mark Johnson during Flyers' January 6, 87 game versus New Jersey. He did not return to action uh, for three weeks. Now, he was eventually suspended, uh, one of his first suspensions, suspensions by the NHL for one game for receiving a third game of misconduct of the season during the Flyers' contest versus New Jersey on March 8, 87. Then he was suspended by the NHL for five games during the 87 campaign for a violent cross-check on Thomas Sandstrom late in the third uh, period of the Flyers' March 17, 87 game versus Rangers. The suspension was announced after the NHL reviewed a videotape provided by the Rangers. Now he missed part of the 88 season uh, with a bruised left hand and wrist, suffered a fight with the big drink of water Wayne Van Dorp during a January 15 game at Pittsburgh. Now he led uh, Philadelphia with a 29.3 uh, percent shooting percentage in 88. And when when he he shot, he usually scored. I mentioned that uh, that the double figures for counters of that season. Now, uh, big injury as well. He suffered a five-inch cut above his left eye when he accidentally hit by Paul Fenton's stick during Edmonton's March 3rd, 89 game at Winnipeg. Now, he also missed part of the 89 season with a sprained hand, an injury he suffered in March 89. Now, he also missed part of the 92 uh, season uh, uh, with... Uh, uh, Bruce's uh, right shoulder during a game against Washington. He was out for about a month. He was also suspended one game by the NHL during the 94 season for receiving his third game misconduct during the Flyers game against Montreal February 21st of that year of 94. Now he was also suspended by one game by the NHL during that same campaign for receiving his fifth game misconduct of the season which was an automatic in the Flyers uh, April 12th 94 game versus New Jersey. Now, uh, breaking down the Sandstrom case, which again, almost changed the league uh, forever. The NHL suspended him for 15 games because when he viciously caught cross-checked Thomas Sandstrom in the face after a whistle during the Flyers' October 1687 game at the Rangers, all hell broke loose. The NHL ruled that Brown had deliberately intended to injure Sandstrom, who was blindsided in no position to defend himself. The suspension... First for 13 consecutive games took effect on March 2nd, 87, and Brown was not eligible to return until December 3rd. In addition, Brown served the 14 and 15 games of suspension by sitting out the Flyers' December 10th and 22 games against the Rangers. Now, Brown's 15-game suspension was the league's longest for an altercation between two players as Will Pema received a similar 15-game suspension uh, and uh, was uh, and, uh, in October 25th, 78, game between Colorado and Detroit. It was also five games short of what at the time was the longest suspension in NHL history. The 20 uh, games Tom Laziak received for hitting linesman Ron Foyt on October 30, 83. Brown in the incident had claimed he did not hear referee Denny Morrell blow the whistle at 12.39 in the third period and did not know play had stopped before he hit Sandstrom. Nevertheless, he had received a five-minute major to match penalty into play and was subject to automatic review by league officials. Videotape, which was played uh, quite heavy, showed that all other players on the ice had heard the whistle, casting doubt on Brown's claim. There was also no doubt that Brown had hit Sandstrom from behind. Brian, uh, Brown had a history of altercations with Sandstrom, one of the best elite players at the time in the NHL, including one in March 87 that led to the suspension. The Flares made no attempt to appeal the, the verdict, although Philadelphia coach Mike Keenan said Brown had likely been provoked because he was not known for using his stick. Keenan never even accused Sandstrom of being the most vicious player in the game because he used his stick when other players would have used their fists. The Rangers, however, were outraged that Brown did not get a longer suspension for a deliberate and unprovoked attempt to injure. Now, I saw the incident and the breakdown. He should have got 40 games because... Uh, he was out to get Sandstrom, we knew that, uh, sort of, 
you know, uh, not uh, not the same thing, but young blood, where a certain uh, goon is tracking down another player and deliberately uh, trying to hurt him. But Sands for me was bad with his stick, like most Europeans. But you don't deserve that. Now, Brown had he had his fans and his favorites, and he's still. I mean, you're not going to be around as a scout in the NHL all those years. But like it was a different NHL because it was kill or be killed. I mean. The Flyers and the Rangers, the Flyers in Montreal, uh, the Flyers and all those uh, Patrick Division East Coast teams, it was rough. And, uh, you know, you can't teach size. Brown knew what his role was, and he could score on occasion. Like, he wasn't a total goon, but for a lot of people, like, they turned against him. See, you can break down an incident as much as you want. It sure Sandstrom uh, was not going to be a fighter, but, you know, it's like Bobby Clark... Uh, when John Ferguson, you know, said go go break his ankle, that's hockey. I mean, what are you going to do? Change a whole league because one incident, there's a lot of incidents like that, never ended up uh, as as uh, what they call as as prominent. But you know, it is. I don't condone it, but I don't turn it down either. I mean, the other team is trying to beat you. What are you going to do? Just lay down? I mean, it's the Flyers. It's a, they're not called the Broad Street Bullies for nothing. They're a tough team. Now. Uh, various awards and honors, or what they call dubious awards. He holds the main Mariners record for most penalty minutes in the season with 418-83. He was AHL penalty minutes leader in 83. Uh, playoffs penalty minutes leader that year again with 107. And he, uh, he that was, by, by the way, an AHL uh, single season record which was since broken. But what's ironic here, his real name, middle name, is James Brown. So, don't make fun of him about that, because even now it might be sensitive. Now, the uh, how he ended up in Edmonton was quite interesting. Philadelphia had traded Brown to Edmonton in exchange for Keith Acton, a future draft boy, a choice, which of course became Dmitry Yuskevich, very good player, on February 7, 89. Two years later, Philly got him back when he traded Craig Fisher, Scott Bellamy, and Craig Berube to the Oilers for, Oilers for Brown, Yerry Curry and Corey Foster on May 30th, 91. Philadelphia lost Brown a second time when he signed with San Jose as a Group 3 unrestricted free agent on August 10th, uh, 1995. So, uh, a very, very interesting uh, way, uh, and Barubi was a tough nut too. So, he's part of, part of the uh, one of the most interesting trades of the early 1990s. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're doing here, give us a like comment and subscribe uh, if you uh, if you're a fan of Dave Brown let me know for a lot of people again he's a polarizing figure for me it's just uh, when you're a gunslinger like that in the NHL 6'5 220 pounds or whatever things are going to happen because their guy is going to go against your guy and I'd rather have Dave Brown on my team than any any, any other team Gay Montreal fits we know what happened in uh, 87 we know what will happen uh, against, uh, again, mostly the Patrick Division squads. Thanks for listening. Bye.